what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, and today is no different. I'm here with Lynn Wyman of Kid Glove, and Lynn, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. You know, since this is kind of the agency theme, um, I did two past episodes with Jason Swank, actually, and one where he talks about what he looks for in purchasing agencies because he has a separate company that actually purchases agencies. That's a really interesting one. Um, Todd Tasky, the episode with him, he actually helps sell agencies, which is interesting. And so he kind of pairs private equity with agency and he's got a podcast, the second bite podcast. And some of the agencies he sells makes more on the second bite than the first bite. So check that out. Um, And many more on uh, inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Lynn, uh, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade than to profile the people and companies I most admire on the podcast and share with the world what they're working on and what they're doing. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. And we're going to talk about Lynn's podcast too. Um, Go to rise25.com, learn more. If you have questions, you can email us at support at rise25.com. And I'm excited. We have Lynn Weinman. She's a marketing veteran. When I say marketing veteran, what I mean is she has over 30 years of experience And her award-winning work has helped a multitude of national, regional, and local organizations achieve their goals. Kid Glove has been recognized multiple times as one of Lincoln, Nebraska's best places to work. And recently, I don't know how recent it is, but it has completed their B Corp certification. It is not easy to get a B Corp certification. I've had several other guests on the podcast. It's rigorous. So um, Kid Gloves Agency for Change podcast, you can check it out. And it's Kid Glove, K-I-D-G-L-O-V.com. So Lynn, thanks for joining me. Ah, Jeremy, thank you for the very generous um, introduction. And I have now got those two podcasts on my list of must listen. So thank you so They're much. They're good for ones. That. Yeah. Tell us what Kid Glove does and, and what you do there. Absolutely. We are a marketing, branding, and advertising agency. We call ourselves Boutique um, because we are we have about 25 people. We're fairly small in the overall agency world, but it allows us to pay a lot of high attention to our clients. And the name Kid Glove is all about taking great care of both our clients, their brands, and then our people with inside of our culture as well. You know, I was listening to an episode on your podcast about the name and where it yes. came from. And then if you look at the logo, um, so I'm going to try and get an answer out of you from this. Yeah. I don't know, but some people think it looks like a pig nose. Some people say it looks like a button. <laughs> the actual logo. Is there an origin of why that um, kind of insignia, what that, what that actually is? A hundred percent, because we are a branding agency that takes branding very seriously. There's a complete story to that, right? I mean, um, we want to be an agency that's a very high touch agency and that's a very insightful agency. And so when you when you really look back to the story of kid gloves, I think most people know the saying to be treated with kid gloves. But even back in the 18th century, Kid gloves were these beautiful designer gloves made of very soft leather. They were a symbol of status and sophistication, and they most often had ornate silver buttons on the side. So when we decided to name Kid Glove because we wanted to emphasize that great care we're taking of people and brands, We liked the button instead of the glove. Everybody thought, oh, your logo will be a glove. We liked the button because it was unexpected. It fit nicely within the name Kid Glove. It becomes our O. And it gives us the chance to talk about buttoning up brands and strategies, right? So it's not a pig nose. 
Although if you think it's a pig nose and you like that, fine. It's not a smiley face. Although if you think it's a smiley face and you like that, fine. But it is, in fact, supposed to be a button. So I want to understand your process for branding a little bit. And, you know, there was a a nonprofit that you helped with rebranding. So can you walk me through that a little bit? Absolutely. Actually, um, in the 12 years of our existence, I think we've helped over 100 nonprofits with their brand messaging strategy. In some cases, that is simply helping them tighten up their messaging, their tagline, their positioning statement. In other cases, it goes all the way to their logo, to their name, to their website, and and all the things. What we know is that nonprofits that have a great brand have better recognition and recall. They do a better job of fostering relationships with their donors. They're easier to find for the people that they serve. And that also sets the stage for a more positive internal culture. So we, a few years ago, helped an organization called the Child Guidance Center, which is a kind of a very basic name. You might think you understand what they're all about. But when we broke it all down and we did the research, we found out that they served more than children, they did more than guidance, and they were more than a center. So even those three words that seemed very simple and understandable um, did not serve them. So we changed their name to Hope Spoke. uh, And Hope Spoke really uh, spoke to... Uh, what they gave to families and what they gave to kids as they came into the organization for services. And now, a few years later, we've really seen that organization grow into a pillar of the community. Um, And just it it's really fun to see how that has lifted them as an organization. It has lifted their employees and even maybe more importantly, it's lifted their fundraising efforts. So where do you start? With that. Uh, but, I mean, yeah. I really like that. And and I, I'm going to pull up the site as you're talking. I really am curious what the logo looks like, because I can picture like the Hope Spoke just I something jumps out as easier to create yeah. a logo than the kind of general child guidance center. But where do you start when and the companies right now may be listening? Go, you know, I know I need to kind of do a rebrand. And, yeah. you know, where do you start with that? Well, because we work with nonprofits, we knew we had to have a process that was laser focused and and affordable, right? So we start with a discovery session. We bring the key leaders, sometimes a few board members, um, whether it's a for-profit or a nonprofit, we bring bring a group of people into a room. We facilitate a 90-minute focus group and really talk about what makes their brand their brand and where they see themselves in the future. Then we follow that with an online survey because we want to validate what the leaders have said, because sometimes there's a huge gap between where the leaders think they are or want to go and where their audiences see them. And so we need to understand that. We do a competitive review. So we we want to make sure we're looking at who are the organizations. If they're a nonprofit, they're probably competing for fundraising. If they're a for-profit, they're competing for um, customers or clients. We do that competitive review. We then uh, determine their brand archetype profile. So um, we use the system that was created in the book uh, called The Hero and the Outlaw, Um, that has 12 different brand archetypes. And we put together a profile that mixes and matches a couple uh, to create a really unique voice. Then from there, we put all of that together, create a brand strategy and create the positioning statement. And uh, if there is a new name involved, it happens at that phase. And then when that, once that phase is complete, we look at graphic identity and then we look at launch because the launch is a really great opportunity to build relationships with audiences as well. That's amazing. What what jumped out with Hope Spoke? Ah, well, yeah. So as we worked with Hope Spoke, you know, one of the key things they deal with mental children's mental health, um, and and family mental health, and sometimes children, you know broadly includes 12 to 18 year olds, but 12 to 18 year olds don't think of themselves as children, right? So so we wanted to get rid of the word children, but still infer that it was serving, um, 
youth. And so the logo for Hope Spoke and the feel of the name has a very youthful feel. They also, it was very important to them not to re-stigmatize the people that come into the center, right? Like you want to be able to walk through the doors of an organization that's going to help you and not make you feel like you have a problem. So the name Hope Spoke really, really, um, once again, spoke to the fact that what they were doing was helping these kids and these families see a bright future. Mm. And so when you, that's the first part, right? What yeah. else do you do that extends into all their messaging, their website, everything? So what oh, are their yeah. services do you do? Yeah. For Hope Spoke, we really, um, we really sat down with them and worked through their launch plan, first of all. So we had their messaging statement, their name, their tagline, their logo, their graphic identity package. We always like to look at who, who do we need to talk to about this new brand and how do we talk to them? Because you want to have the right message at the right time um, in the right order. So we helped them set up several different meetings and presentations and parties, you know, to their board, to their employees, to their top donors, um, to their partners, and then to the public. Because it's such a great chance to let people know you are so important to us. You are on the inside. We are telling you this really important story before it goes public. But then we did help them with a, a graphic style guide. We helped them launch the website. Almost everybody right now, your website is the cornerstone of everything that you do. We help them uh, start their literature system. We help them kick off a fundraising initiative. So those were just a few of the things that we did in the beginning to help ensure that the um, that the name went out in a very positive way. They had such a great executive director, Katie McLee Stevenson. And on the day we launched to her employees, you know, she had everybody together. We were in the ballroom of a of a local um, organization, and I came in and helped her present. And before I presented, I said, Katie, no fewer than 12 people are going to tell you before the end of the day that this is the silliest idea you've ever had, right? Because when you rename something, people are familiar with the familiar. They're comfortable with the familiar. And when you come out with a new name, initially it feels shocking to people until they fully understand and embrace it. So she did call me the next morning. She said, Lynn, I think there were only five. This has got to be a success. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes great ideas are met with resistance because you're really trying to think outside of the box and garner attention. You know, I, I think that's, first of all, amazing advice that's, that ba that's baked into what you just said to agency or any company, which is... Um, just mentioning objections before they happen. Because if yes. you didn't say that, she could have been like thinking in her head and never went back and told you, oh, all these people hate it. She's just second guessing everything that she just did. So by saying that, letting people know what's going to happen before it happens and some of the maybe, um, you know, bumps in the row, that, that's so key. Yeah, it, it is 100% key. I mean, the key the key to life is managing expectations, I like to say, right? But, um, you know, just because somebody doesn't like something, you'll, you'll never have something that 100% of the people like. You may have something that 100% of the people are willing to ignore, but that is the opposite of what you want in branding. I always, it's, it's the pistachio vanilla thing, right? If if you were at a conference and you were trying to get a thousand people not to complain, you serve them vanilla ice cream. But nobody stays awake at night dreaming of vanilla ice cream or very few. There's a much smaller group that like pistachio, but man, those people that like pistachio are willing to drive, get up in the middle of the night. They've got their favorite brands. And, and I think most brands want to be more pistachio than vanilla. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that branding process. It's really valuable. in. You know, once you have that, you're getting it out into the world, you do it internally, then externally. And I know you think and talk about, you know, cause marketing and purpose driven marketing. Yeah. So tell me about that. Right. So I do think there's there is so much data right now that after coming through the pandemic and, and what we have been through as humans, 
that that people are really thinking more intentionally about wanting to align with brands that are making a positive impact in the world. Um, As a matter of fact, I recently did a Facebook Live and a blog post on the fact that over there are studies that show that over 70% of people want to align with brands that make a positive impact. And that number gets even higher as you look at younger generations. And then um, I think the number is in the 80s when you look at the number of employees that want to align with positive brands. So it's really been a growth area for Kid Glove. Um, we we have always had a strong foundation in uh, nonprofit marketing, but now we see more and more businesses coming to us uh, to get out a purpose-driven message. We also have organizations coming to us to get out social impact campaigns. So topics such as behavioral health, parenting, um, health care, vaccines have been a big one lately. Um, and so that has been a big trend as well. And, and one of the things you look at is um, campaigns and looking and making sure they don't have implicit bias. Yeah, That seems like a very difficult thing to do because yeah. we have a bias. Like sometimes we're not even aware of our bias. Well, I think that's the definition of implicit right, right. bias, right? Like exactly. A, a bias that you're not aware of. Uh, you know, like it how do does... you fix something you're not aware of? Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the the first step, the first step, Jeremy, is uh, awareness. The first step is really um, taking a look at what are the biases that we might have as a, as an agency, as a strategy team, as a creative team. What are biases that our clients might have, and often. You know, they're not biases that are are seated in any kind of, you know, evilness. They're just the way that we have been hardwired to think. So, uh, you know, we in January sent our entire creative team through some training to help them become aware of implicit bias and and to help them become more aware of what we can do as an agency to overcome that. Because... Uh, once again, not only is it the right thing to do, there is a lot of data out there that, um, you know, demonstrating diversity and accessibility in advertising really does, uh, is improving results. It's improving conversions and recall and building trust and relationships with brands as well. So, you know, for us, we have actually changed our creative brief. Um, to incorporate a few questions that help bring in conversation and thinking about bias. We have also updated our discovery process uh, for when we brand to open the doors to more of that conversation. And we're just providing more and more education to our team, to our clients, and, and actually making it available for free to people in the industry as well on the, the importance of that topic. Yeah, I'd love to hear what was eye-opening in the training. What did people report back that stuck out? Yeah, I think, um, you know, really a, a key thing is that, um, first of all, I think a key thing is that we have implicit bias, right? I think um, almost to a person, our creative team felt like, you know, I don't have bias. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just moving forward. Um, and going through this training made us realize, even though it's not based in evil or, uh, you know, malicious intent, we all do have biases and, and just by being aware of that, we can open the doors to making a positive change. Um, we also learned the impact, the positive impact that it, it would make. And we're really working now um, to shore up and, and create some um, review panels and some invite some people in that can help us with cultural competencies as well. What were some, you mentioned there's some questions that you incorporated. Um, I don't know if you have them handy or an example of a question that you incorporated to bake into your process so it helps so you don't have as much bias. Yeah. One of the one of the key questions is is in thinking about the audience, because I think a lot of us were taught in marketing school, particularly in media planning, to kind of 
zero in on that primary audience and just, you know, go forward towards that audience, right? And so one of the questions we ask is, how can we think about the audience differently to make sure that we're providing access? So that's a really, really important question to make sure that, you know, you're not just zeroing in on kind of a a persona of one audience member, but that you're opening up because, you know, what we have to be aware of is that the cultural profile of the United States is changing and it's, it's going to change and, and what our audiences look like today is not going to be what they look like in the future. And so we need to be thinking about the future. Another question that we ask is, beyond your product or service, what is it that you're doing or could be doing to positively give back? And this helps us identify causes or cultural and environmental aspects um, that we can include in marketing as well. You did an episode uh, about this with Lillian Forsyth. Yeah. Yeah. Lillian Forsyth is amazing. She's actually the person who through the uh, four A's or American Association of Advertising Agencies facilitated the training with us. And, and Lillian is so thoughtful. Um, and, and I think what she did was she just, she didn't come to it from a standpoint of saying, you know, hey, you guys are bad. You have to get better. She did this really great four-part um, training where it was a lot of question and answer. It was a lot of, hey, share some campaigns that you're working on and let's work through together how we could how we could make them better. And, and she was really great. And I that's one of my favorite episodes of the Agency for Change podcast as well. So anybody who's looking to add more diversity or remove bias from their marketing, that'd be a great episode to listen to. How does um, diversity of staff play a role in that? I think diversity of staff is important um, and it's not always easy, right? Um, particularly if, if you're based in, in Nebraska, but you, we can't use that as an excuse, right? Um, there is just, uh, we all have different learned experiences, right? And so if your agency account team is made up of people from a specific demographic or socioeconomic group, and there's no diversity in that group, it's going to be very hard for you to make that work. So, you know, I I would even give you an example of that kid glove. Um, Our hiring practice used to be to require advertising agency experience to, um, you know, to, to, apply for or obtain one of our open positions. Um, But yet then we complained because in Nebraska, there's not a lot of cultural diversity in the people who work in the advertising agencies. So if we're putting that requirement into our job descriptions, we're instantly saying we're not opening the doors to diversity, at least at this time. So we have removed that from our job descriptions and have really, you know, set some new um, interviewing and hiring uh, policies to help open the doors. And we've also worked to, in the past, as we were a smaller agency, we had to expect people to come in and hit the ground running. We now are opening up more of a training runway so we can bring in people without that experience as well. So that's been important to us. But we really are right now to working on creating an advisory panel um, and, and in a, a group of advisors in different cultural competencies to help us out as well. I love that. That's a great idea for any company advisory panel. Right. I, I think so too. I think so too. Jeremy, we're like, for example, we're working on a campaign right now um, called Max the Vax. And it is a collaboration between the department, Nebraska Department of Education and Children's Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. And the, the goal of the campaign is for more kids to have COVID-19 vaccines before they enter school in mm. 2023. Not and, controversial at all. Oh my goodness, it's very controversial. It's <laughs> probably the campaign where I've received the most hate mail, not personally, but to <laughs> the campaign. It's a very controversial topic, but also a very important topic. There's there's so much data that shows, you know, the, 
the importance of keeping kids safe, the the importance of keeping kids in school um, for their own mental health and education processes. And, you know, we're in the midst of a workforce shortage. So if if kids are coming home from school for an extended amount of time, that means then parents are out of the workforce and just the there's so many things, you know, riding on keeping kids healthy. So um, when we started this campaign, we had to move very quickly. I mean, if you work on social impact causes and something like the pandemic, new data is coming out, new variances, new, like the temperature of the room, it feels like changes every month, if not even faster than that. So what we did is we looked at a lot of a, uh, available data that said there is a definite wait and see category. Like the people who have already decided they're going to have their kids vaccinated will be there once they become available. The people who've decided no, never are, are not going to be there, right? But there's this middle group. And so we were able to demographically see this middle group is made up um, not of you know, your your average Nebraska citizen, it's made up of some very specific demographic groups. And so the entire campaign uh, was designed to amplify the voice of pediatricians and healthcare providers with the target of, of very specific demographic groups. So how do you get that out there? So, I mean, there's a never, yeah. they're not going to be convinced. There's a yes, they're already convinced. And then you have the wait and see. and getting that information in front of them. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. So we looked at because because we had very targeted groups, we did uh look at digital as our primary um digital and social as our our primary medium. So we're very targeted, but we continue to watch all of the data we see and all of the data we see says the voice of the pediatrician or healthcare provider because there's many parts of the state of Nebraska uh, where families don't have access to pediatricians, but they have access to other healthcare providers, um, is the most effective voice. So, you know, we developed a series of uh, very informal videos of doctors speaking off the cuff, answering questions, you know, sharing why they feel it's important for kids to be vaccinated. And we combined that with some messages from uh, the Department of Education, from teachers, and then also some just very fun messages. So, you know, we're trying not to make it finger wagging, like you should do this or shaming, but but to make it, it positive, so the messages kind of seep in, maybe they impact the kids, maybe they impact the parents. You know, as a company, the companies that we decide to serve, I feel like are it's a big decision, right? right. And we're taking a stand. So when you decided to take on that project, did you were you worried about risks of other companies that you work with? I mean, because... Even within a company, everyone has varying views. I mean, you yeah. could have a company of 200 people and maybe 10 of them have a totally different view and the other, you know, 190 don't. So how are you thinking about that? I mean, maybe yeah. you weren't. No, I think that's very important. Like, I think any company, any company that takes on a cause, right? So, so Kid Glove took on Max the Vax as a cause, but... It it also was a client of ours too, right? But, you know, if you take on a cause, you have to ask yourself a couple of things. You have to ask yourself, is this in line with our organizational values? Do we have something of value to add to the conversation? And will this be, um, will most of our clients be in agreement? Once again, if you are waiting for all of your clients or everyone in your audience to be in agreement, you're never going to do anything. You are going to be vanilla, right? And so at Kid Glove, we do specialize in nonprofit marketing. We specialize in social impact marketing, and we specialize in purpose-driven business marketing, which also often breaks out into healthcare organizations and community banks and credit unions. So we know that the clients we serve, you know, are primarily going to be in that umbrella of of supporting this campaign. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, 
I was talking to an agency owner the other week and they were saying, they started with, here's what I don't serve. Because I was asking them, you know, who are ideal yeah. clients for you? And they go, well, I don't do anything in cannabis. And then there's companies that only do yeah, cannabis, right? Right, right. And right. they go, I don't do anything in wep- weapons and ammunition. And there's companies that, you know, yeah. want to focus on that stuff. So just interesting where people kind of fall. Um, you know, I think, Jeremy, yeah. I think the importance of that is agencies build up a body of expertise. So marketing a nonprofit or social impact uh, or campaign or cause is very different than your standard product marketing, right? And so, or retail marketing, right? And so we we have done product marketing and we have and we do some product marketing, but more as it's part of a, a more of a cause or purpose driven business. Um, but we know how to communicate um, about complex and abstract topics um, that change behavior. Right. And I think that's different than, hey, I know if somebody came to us and said, hey, I want to launch this online product and, and I, you know, I want to do all this stuff with inventory and online product sales, that would not be a good fit. It would not be a good fit for us. It would not be profit. Even if they just landed on our doorstep and begged us to take the work, it it potentially would not even be profitable for us because we would have to, you know, educate our team on new things um, that they don't do in the normal course of their work. Yeah. Lynn, you mentioned, you know, the, your agency has been around for over a decade and, you know, listening to some of the podcast episodes, it seems like, oh, so-and-so has been here since the beginning. This person has <laughs> been here since the beginning. So I'd love to hear about what you do and what we could all learn from you about culture, taking care of yeah. people and how do they stay the longevity there? So what do you do to keep people staying in uh, the culture? Yeah. I'm going to tell you, I'm very proud of the fact that we're in the midst of the great resignation, right? We've only had one person leave in the last 12 months, and that person uh, changed careers. So it wasn't even just to go to another agency. They're, they're actually doing a very different job than they were for us. So um, for us, I believe my number one responsibility is taking care of the people at Kid Glove. Um, and... If I take care of our people and I make sure we even have this project, we call it the Creative Nirvana Project, and it is our agency-wide ongoing focus to create the best environment for doing creative and strategic work um, that we can possibly have. We're always working on it. But if I do that, then my people will be happy and productive. And if my people are happy and productive, our clients are going to be happy. And then the whole thing will just keep going around. And sometimes I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it because it seems like such a simple secret sauce, but it is our secret sauce. Um, I mean, it is a reason why we are a continuous best places to work. Um, And when we get the feedback for best places to work back, It's always fun to see that, you know, one year, the number one word people used in their comments about Kid Glove was love and how the people in our agency love what they do and they love working with one another. So that's a pretty satisfying thing. So the Creative Nirvana Project. Yeah. So how does that work? Do they have certain time periods during the week or? Yeah. So we... um, We started the project with three sessions and we brought our entire creative team together. And let's see if I can remember this, but session number one was, what does it feel like when things are just great? When you're in the zone and you're in the zone and it just feels like you can't fail and the ideas are flowing and you just go home at the end of the day and you love what you do. And and we just really analyzed What gets us to that situation? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Session two was a little bit of a bummer. Session two was, what does it look like, feel like when things just suck, right? Because they do sometimes. And so am I allowed to say that on the podcast, by the way? Okay, great. So Jeremy, we just talked about what, what what makes it not great. And then the third session was, all right. How do we get from where we are, which is pretty good, 
Uh, but I'm always striving for more than pretty good. Um, how do we get from where we are to where we want to be? And when we have meetings like that, we like to talk about what are some quick wins and what are some big things that we can do. So, um, so we started in that way, and that was last year. And as we set our pillars for 2022, we made Creative Nirvana a pillar, but we extended it and said, you know, this isn't just about the creative people. This is about everyone. How do we pull everyone into this? Because everyone's part of the creativity. And so we just did an all agency meeting where um, we broke everybody up into small groups and they came back and presented like, here are the things that they, they want to do. So, and our creative directors, it's now part of their job responsibilities um, and our operations manager, it's part of their job responsibilities to be continually moving us towards a creative nirvana culture. Lynn, thank you. Yeah, First of absolutely. all, I want to point people towards, I have a, I just mapped out your next book while you were talking. So I'm going to share it with you in a second, but I want to point people to your website, which is kidglove.com, K-I-D-G-L-O-V. Check out, they also have um, the, the podcast page on there, but but I have Creative Nirvana, the three pillars to cultural success, or how do you maintain a rock star culture? And then the chapters are, um, session one is in the zone. Uh, yeah. Chapter session two is bummer, the bummer section. <laughs> yeah. And then session three is the path. You know, how I do you get to where you that. are? So I hope I get to read or listen to your book at some point in the future about Creative Nirvana. So thank you I just that. want to be the first one to thank you so much. Um, everyone check out the website, check out more episodes of Inspired Insider and, and much more. So thanks, Lynn. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand